Okay, let's go through the first four sections of chapter 22 on wave optics. So light is a wave, as we learned earlier, and we will apply the wave model to light. So if you look at a water wave that travels along and goes through an opening in a sort of a breakwater that stops, sort of reflects these waves, you'll see that immediately on the other side of the breakwater, there's no waves, uh, but the waves go through the opening and when they go through they spread out okay so they they start off as uh, sort of linear or lines here or plane waves uh, before they go through the opening when they go through a narrow opening where the uh, width of the opening is uh, about the same uh, as the wavelength or less than the wavelength then they come out spherical on the other side so this and this is, is called diffraction this is a well-known wave effect and the first thing we notice about light is that it doesn't really seem to diffract when we have a shadow. We are used to shadows being fairly sharp, especially if they're from uh, point sources of light. So the lack of a noticeable diffraction with light uh, means that the wavelength of light must be very small. So in this case, this door must be much uh, greater than the wavelength of light, which we, we know to be true. The wavelength of light is is uh, it's less than a micron, so less than a thousandth of a millimeter. But as it turns out, if you do make the opening very, very small, for example, even a 0.1 um, tenth of a millimeter wide opening, and you shine laser light on it, then you do see that there's some spreading, some diffraction, and uh, some little uh, dark and bright uh, stripes. And this is, this is called diffraction. So it's only observable if the hole is sufficiently small. And that's what we're going to study for most of this chapter. So we have various models of light. Um, since light is definitely a wave, that's a fact, uh, there is a wave model. Okay, so And that's called wave optics. That's what we will be studying in this chapter 22. Um, also, light can be th uh, thought of as a ray. Okay, So if your optics are much bigger than the wavelength of light, then the fact that light is a wave doesn't really matter, and you can use you can just say light travels in straight lines called rays. So that's the ray model. And when we get into chapter 23, that's what we'll start uh, start using. And then if you go on to quantum mechanics, you'll uh, eventually get to the photon model of light, which is that light doesn't really behave like a wave, um, wave or a ray. It's 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 a stream of little uh, particles called photons, and that's called the quantum theory of light. Okay, so back to the wave model. Uh, I think the simplest way to start the wave model of light is not to look at one slit, but to look at two slits. So uh, it's called the Young's double slit experiment. What it is, is you start off with a single wavelength of light, like a laser. You shine it on to two uh, parallel uh, holes, or parallel slits in a, in a screen that is opaque. And then this light goes through, and you observe uh, what happens out here in a viewing screen. Okay, so the waves will actually diffract through both of these slits and then overlap. The pattern overlaps, and you get these, uh, you always get this zebra pattern of bright uh, and dark fringes. Okay, a fringe would be a uh, bright fringe or a dark fringe, these stripes. So and if you look at it from overhead, uh, it's a little hard to visualize, but here is the plane waves of light coming over, coming from left to right with a wavelength uh, lambda. They hit these slits and then they spread out. And when they're overlapping, you get these, uh, you get this uh, diffraction pattern, this interference pattern. And if you think about uh, the distance from each slit to this, this viewing screen. So I guess you're sort of seeing sideways what's on the viewing screen. If you look right at the center here, the distance from the top slit to this center point of the screen is equal to, th to the distance from the bottom slit. And so since these distances are equal, the same number of wavelengths uh, will be between uh, this path and this path, and you'll have constructive interference. If there's a maximum here, they'll, you know, if there's a maximum here from the top slit, there'll be a maximum from the bottom slit, and vice versa. So they'll always constructively interfere. But if you go up a little ways, then what'll happen is there'll be half a wavelength more distance from the bottom slit uh, than from the top slit, 
and you'll have uh, perfectly destructive interference here. So you'll get a dark fringe. So then it goes constructive, destructive, constructive. And if you want to get the math behind it, you have to uh, actually draw, you have to draw it twice is what I usually do. So this is the big picture of the double slit experiment. And you don't actually, at this scale, you don't even really see the slits. They're very close together, somewhere right in this dot. And then there's a viewing screen way over here. Uh, and you are going to figure out what is the intensity from the double slit at point P on the viewing screen at an angle theta. Um, which is measured relative to going straight through. So there's a central maximum. So the next slide will show a zoom in of just the slits, but it'll be, uh, we won't be able to fit the viewing screen on that view. So let's zoom in. So now we are just seeing the double slits and the viewing screen is way, way, way off to the right. And so these paths right here, path length R1 and R2, they do meet and touch at point P way off to the right, but they're almost parallel on this diagram. So, and that's good, because then we can uh, just draw a little right angle triangle down here, and this distance right here, this, uh, I guess, opposite of the theta, uh, is equal to the, the difference in path R1, R2 minus R1. It's the delta r. And you can find from this triangle, it's just d sine theta, where d is the distance between the two slits. It's the hypotenuse of this triangle. So what will happen is you'll have uh, bright fringes, constructive interference, when this delta r is equal to some integer multiple of wavelengths. And you'll have uh, destructive when it's half integer multiples of the wavelengths. So that gives you uh, an equation the angles of the bright fringes are where theta is equal to m times lambda over d. This is where theta is in, uh, is in radians. And what we've done here is we've actually used the small angle approximation that sine theta uh, is approximately equal to tan theta, which is approximately equal to theta. Okay. And uh, the y position on the screen uh, depends on then the L. So you just multiply by uh, by L and you get the distance on the, uh, up away from the central maximum of where these fringes uh, come in. And M here is just an integer, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. Okay, so and if you look at the intensity, the light intensity, it turns out that it's 4 times I1 times cosine squared of this uh, this function of y. So, uh, and what that means is I1 is the intensity of the light just from one slit only over here. So if you had, I guess, and this is 2i, so one slit would just g give an even illumination uh, right down here. Two slits, if they didn't interfere, would give an even uh, uh, illumination at 2i1. But what happens with the actual interference pattern is that it oscillates between zero, so darkness, and four, with an average uh, of two uh, of the intensity. So that, so that makes sense sort of conservation of energy. This energy gets um, uh, gets put into these bright fringes that are you know, twice as bright as they should be, and then they're separated by uh, darkness where uh, there's no light at all. So. Uh, and what we have ignored here is that actually the, these slits are each single slits that will, will spread out and diffract. So in reality, what happens is you have sort of a, uh, a double slit, uh, cosine squared function convolved with a big central maximum that's very wide. Okay, so uh, we've done two slits. Now the next step is actually to do three and four and five, and uh, in general, n slits. So you, it's like the double slit experiment. You illuminate from one side with some monochromatic light of single wavelength. Uh, and what you find is that bright fringes occur at, uh, we'll show this, that the d sine theta is equal to m times lambda, where m again is one uh, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. And you can find the y positions uh, with this tangent. So the way it works is here we've just shown 10 slits here. Um, they're each a distance d apart. 
and again this is a top view looking down but what we find is this delta r again is d sine theta same as with two slits but now we have many many slits all interfering and so again any time that this d sine theta is some integer number of wavelengths then you're going to find constructive interference between any two of these uh, of these purple lines okay and so uh, m here this um, integer is what we call the order of the diffraction so this would be the zeroth order is the cent central maximum the first order second order uh, and the wave amplitude um, so just the electric field amplitude is n times the amplitude of, of one of the waves and because intensity uh, is uh, proportional to the square of the amplitude the intensity of the of each of these fringes is actually n squared uh, times I1, uh, where I1 w is how much in intensity comes from a single slit. So these are very bright uh, maxima, since n is large and n squared is very large. Uh, diffraction gratings can be used instead of a prism to uh, spread a light out into its uh, different wavelengths. So uh, if you've got a diffraction grating over here, uh, there's certainly all the wavelengths overlap uh, at the zeroth order since it's always the same distance there so you get sort of white light coming through there but at the first order uh, on either side that's the first order on the top first order on the bottom uh, you get a little rainbow so um, the, the bluer light has a longer wavelength than the violet light so it is it ends up with a higher value of theta so it ends up at a different position and it'll be the same with the, all the higher orders as that you'll have have little rainbows and uh, so that's with little openings you can do the same thing um, with a mirror as long as the mirror has little parts that are not reflective or even if uh, the mirror is uh, has a surface that has little grooves uh, cut in it. So these are called reflection gratings. So you have incident white light that comes down and then all all these different um, parallel grooves in the mirror surface will interfere, the reflect light, reflected light will interfere and at higher orders, the first order, second order reflection, you'll get, uh, you'll get little rainbows. And so a lot of uh, spectrographs that people build will use uh, reflective diffraction gratings as opposed to instead of prisms to, uh, to spread the light out into its wavelengths. And this even occurs naturally. So a peacock feather consists of little parallel rods of melanin uh, which act as a reflect reflection grating. So this is a, a microscopic view of a peacock feather. And what happens there is that depending on which way you look at the peacock feather, you see different colors because the white light is, is um, diffracting as it comes off there. Okay, so we've done the double slit and many slits. Actually, the hardest one to really understand, I think, is the single slit. So when light passes through a single slit, uh, it diffracts out. And the pattern looks a little strange. There's a central maximum. Uh, and then there's these uh, dark fringes uh, that, uh, that are then separated by these little bright fringes. And so it's the same sort of setup as the double slit. You've got the uh, opaque screen, uh, a slit cut there, uh, incident wavelength or incident light with some wavelength lambda, and then some viewing screen way over there. Now to understand this, uh, conceptually, it's good to think about um, Huygens' principle. So these are called Huygens' wavelength. Uh, Huygens wavelets. A wavelet is a little part of a big wave. So if you have a plane wave coming along, um, at each part of the plane you can consider uh, every point on that plane to be a source of a little spherical wave that spreads out. And then if you look over to the right, all these little spherical waves will uh, interfere to produce another plane wave and then that becomes uh, another source of little Huygens spherical wavelets and you see the plane wave propagating along and it works also for spherical waves uh, if you have spherical wave coming out each point on the spherical surface is a source of another wavelet and then when you watch those wavelets go out they interfere to produce another big spherical wave and uh, 
if you take a plane wave again and you cut off the top and bottom by um, putting an opaque screen, then what happens is that you get the same sort of uh, Huygen wavelet uh, interference in the center, and so you get these plane waves that continue in the center, but at the edges, it starts to spread out, okay, because you've cut off the, all the little Huygen wavelets above that would have made these plane waves. So that's, that's where diffraction through a single slit sort of comes from. And your mathematical analysis will be similar. You'll look at all the different little oscillators uh, al along here and do an integral. And so uh, you have several wavelets that go straight ahead that go over to the screen. If the screen is very far to the right, um, then what will happen is that since these are all parallel, they'll all be in phase with each other and you'll have constructive interference at the center. If you go off at an angle, um, then each of these little... Uh, pairs of waves separated by A over 2 um, will will interfere. So what you can do is make make a, um, N over 2 pairs of little points, each separated by half the, the width of the slit. And you can make them interfere when delta R12 of this 1 and this 2 down here uh, is uh, this d, a, which is a over 2 times sine theta, farther than this wavelet up there 1. So um, so you do the math, and you end up with uh, this theta is equal to p times lambda over a, where p is uh, 1, 2, and 3. These are the locations of the dark fringes, where you actually have uh, destructive interference because there's always constructive interference at the, at the center and so you're finding the positions of the darker fringes here. Um, so again conceptually we'll go through this in class but conceptually uh, if you've got a, uh, a single slit then the, you have a bright central maximum Okay, which is much brighter than the secondary maxima or any of the tertiary or, or fourth. And the width of the central maximum is always twice the uh, spacing between the dark fringes on either side. So these dark fringes, if they have a distance uh, between them of, of D or something, then the, the center two will be 2D apart. So the width of the central slit, which is defined as the distance between these two interior uh, d dark fringes is uh, 2 times lambda times L, the, the distance to the screen, divided by the uh, width of the slit. Which means that, of course, if you put this screen further away, the whole pattern spreads out. But also, if you narrow the slit, then the width of the pattern increases. So this is one of the strange things about diffraction, is that the narrower the slit, the more the waves spread out and become spherical, and so uh, the wider this pattern is.